as Muslims, well, alhamdulillah, are blessed with a revelation from Allah Azawajal. And this revelation tells us to present the message of Islam to other people with hikmah. Uh, that's the title of this organization, Al-Hikmah, with wisdom. Uh, the 16th chapter of the Quran, the 125th uh, ayat, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, What do I la sabidika bil hikmati wal mu'izati al Invite to the way of your Lord with hikmah, with wisdom, and with beautiful exhortation, with preaching. Uh, we then need to present the message of Islam with wisdom to other people. When we talk to people of other faiths, it, it is part of wisdom that we should know how to make the message relevant to them. And so we, I was in a street uh, uh, dawah with some brothers at, uh, on one occasion uh, in Manchester many years ago. And somebody came to our dawah table, and the brother right away started telling this person about Abraham, and this is the religion of Abraham, and so on. But uh, it turned out, uh, as the conversation unfolded, that the person we were talking to knew nothing about Ibrahim, a.s. So our dawah brother just simply assumed uh, that everyone is going to know something about Ibrahim, a.s. and about the biblical tradition, but not everyone. So we need to know who we are talking to and we need to tailor our message to what is relevant to them. And that means we need to know something about their backgrounds, about their faiths and so on. So let's know something about the world's religions. We can't cover all of that in one lecture, but I can only stimulate your learning uh, of the world's religions by mentioning a few points here and there. But you have to go back and do your own homework, do your own reading, because we have an obligation to spread this uh, message. So know something about the religions, uh, the religion of Japan, known as the Shinto uh, religion. Know some of their background stories, so you can mention that, about how one of the female gods became pregnant and gave birth to the islands of Japan. So you, you use that as a conversation starting point to call them towards Tawheed, towards the belief in the one unseen creator of the heavens and the earth. Um, call them from the myths that they have uh, towards uh, the reasonable belief uh, in the all-powerful supreme creator of the heavens and the earth. Know something about Chinese religions. Chinese are not a small population. Uh, how is it that Muslims for so many hundreds of years have not developed a, a cohesive program of presenting the message of Islam uh, to the Chinese population of the world? Know something about the Chinese uh, religions, of Taoism, and uh, know their idea that uh, is somewhat uh, similar uh, to our idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of all things. But they say that there is a great Tao, the way, and uh, one needs to align oneself with that way. And as far as that thinking, uh, they have a story that shows that you should accept things as they are and as they happen, because at the end of the day, who knows what is good and uh, what is bad. So they tell a story uh, about uh, a man who had a son and uh, he wanted his son to work on the farm. He didn't want his son to be conscripted into the, into the army. So when uh, his son uh, went out and, uh, or, or rather, I need to, a, a different starting point, uh, one of his horses got lost. So uh, his, uh, his neighbors came to commiserate with him because he lost his horse, but he said, who knows what is good and what is bad. Eventually the horse came back, and in the meantime the horse had befriended some other, some wild horses, and they came as well. Now his, uh, the neighbors came back to congratulate him on his windfall game of all of these horses. Now his son uh, rode one of the horses and he fell and broke his leg. So each time uh, the neighbors come over and each time uh, the uh, farmer says, who knows what is good and what is bad. Eventually the army people came to conscript the young men of that area and seeing this one has got a broken leg, they left him alone. And in the end the farmer was able to say, who knows what is good and what is bad. He got his wishes in the end through this roundabout way. So, uh, in a way, that corresponds to our sense that uh, things are happening 
uh, by the will and permission of Allah Azawajal, and He knows uh, what He does for what good reasons, and uh, we try our best, but in the end we surrender to Allah Azawajal and to his hikmah. Here, this word hikmah is coming up again and again. Uh, Brother Maruf, I'm doing a lot of advertising here for your uh, organizer. Uh, excellent choice of name. So know something about uh, the other major Chinese, re Chinese religion, Confucianism. Started out by a man uh, named uh, Kung Fu Tzu, and he's just pronounced Confucius by people who don't want to bother uh, saying that name in its uh, original pronunciation. So Confucianism is basically a system of ethics on how to treat other people, how a father should speak to his children, how two brothers should speak to each other, how a man and his friend should behave towards each other. This, is, this system of ethics is part of what Islam is. Islam encompasses the goodness of all of the major world religions. And, and that's a starting point for you to say to somebody, you know what? Yeah, oh, you, you, you belong to Confucianism? That's great, because you know, I've learned that your religion teaches these great ethical teachings about how people should deal with each other and uh, have good ethics and character and morals in the way that they treat each other. Well, you know what? Uh, my, my religion teaches that too. So now, you, you build affinity with that person. They can say, oh yeah, finally I met somebody who is intelligent. That's how they think of you. Because they think that you know something that they know to be true. And they count you as being intelligent. They want to hear more about your religion because your religion is similar to theirs at least in one point. Is our religion about ethics? Yes. Although we ourselves sometimes uh, fail uh, to fulfill our obligation in demonstrating the ethical teachings of Islam. As uh, we and myself and the other speakers, together with the Brother Tanvir and his uh, family, uh, we approached the city of Birmingham today. Uh, we got a little bit lost um, just to, in the last uh, few minutes of our journey um, when it came to finding the, our hotel. Well, we found the hotel, but we couldn't find specifically uh, the way to get into the hotel, driving in there. And so we went around uh, a couple of uh, blocks until uh, it became clear to our driver uh, that the best way forward is to ask someone for directions. And we asked uh, a truck driver and he started to give us the directions. You turn right and then left and then right again and then left again. That's how it sounded to me. And uh, so our driver tried to repeat it and then it was clear that it was too complicated. So that truck driver said, you know what? I'm going the same way. Follow me. And uh, so we turned around, we got behind the truck, we followed him uh, to where he was going to make a, a turn away from the desired destination. He, he stopped, he got off his, out of his truck, he came to ours, to our vehicle, and then he said to our driver, you just go straight up here, I'm going to turn, but you go straight up here, you'll find the hotel. So uh, what this story illustrates, uh, I believe, uh, is that sometimes, we need to walk the talk. Sometimes it's not enough to just simply give somebody a book and say, this is Islam. They may not be able to follow that book. It may seem too complicated. They need to see it in you. They need to see that the Muslim has Muslim character. A Muslim demonstrates Muslim behavior. That will speak much more than tons of books. Now they want to know, who are you? Why did you stop to perform this random act of kindness? What does your religion teach? I want to know more. So sometimes we have to walk that talk. In any case, uh, my focus mainly in this talk will be uh, about the theoretical issues. But, but don't forget that we need to demonstrate that truth we're talking about in our own life and practice as well. We need to lead people by example and take them there rather than give them a book and tell them that this is how you get there. So know something about the Chinese religions. Know something about the religions uh, of India. Know about Hinduism. How is it that Muslims lived for so many years in India and in fact were the ruling power in India for hundreds of years and yet we have not conveyed the message to our fellow uh, human beings in that uh, 
Indo-Pak subcontinent. So Hinduism comprises many different religions and many gods, but uh, there is a sense among many Hindus that there should be only one god. So the Upanishads, which were, uh, which were written uh, about uh, the 6th or 10th century uh, BC, uh, says that although there are some 33 crore of gods, which is something like, I don't know, 310 million or something like this, uh, you, you know better. I, I don't speak Urdu, unfortunately. I was born in Guyana. My foreparents came from India, but they came as indentured uh, British servants. And the, the emphasis uh, that uh, they live by is to teach their children English so that the children could get uh, respectable jobs. Otherwise, without English, you have to work on the cane, uh, sugar cane farms, uh, cutting sugar cane, and it was not uh, an easy task. Uh, to get up in life, one needed to know the language uh, of Britain, and uh, so our parents uh, focused on teaching us English. They spoke a little bit of uh, uh, Indian languages to themselves, uh, but uh, not to the children. And of course, when they wanted to tell a secret to each other, they didn't want the children to know, that's when the Urdu came out. But the rest of the time, they spoke English uh, to themselves, uh, to each other, and uh, to us. So, uh, I. I regret that I don't know the beautiful uh, Urdu language. Uh, though I look brown, obviously, right? Do I look brown? <laughs> yeah. So people look at me and they start speaking to me in Urdu, and so I learn a few uh, words, or something like this, uh, because that's, I've been asked so many times. Um, maybe I've even, I've say, even saying that wrong, so please forgive me for that. So, uh, we need to know something about the Indian religion, so again, we can build some common ground. And we can talk to them about something which is there in their religion that they may have neglected, and at the same time, we want to use that as a stepping stone to call them to Tawheed, to the oneness of Allah Azawajal. Here we have a starting point, because although they believe in such uh, some 310 million gods, nevertheless, the Rupanishad says, that all of these is one God. How exactly? Uh, this is a different uh, problem, but at least you have a starting point. At least we all can affirm that there is only one God. Now that one God has sent us a message. Here is the message. This is a message from your God to you. Don't neglect this message from God. Now you want to introduce them to that uh, message. Know something about Buddhism, which uh, emerged out of Hinduism. Siddhartha Gautama was a Hindu prince, and uh, his uh, father wanted to groom, groom him for leadership and kept him away from society, um, basically secluded in, in the palace, and uh, where he would just learn how to become the next king. But this prince was uh, curious about life outside, so he stole his way out of the uh, palace and he began to see what life was really outside the palace. And he saw that people were suffering. And he meditated until he came up with what is uh, referred to in, that, uh, in what would now be known as Buddhism, as the Four Noble uh, Truths. It's referred to as Buddhism, not after the name of the founder, Siddhartha Gautama, because the word Buddha means the enlightened one. So it's understood that he meditated until he reached the state of enlightenment. He's the enlightenment, enlightened one, and Buddhism is that religion about this enlightenment. So it is thought that there's suffering everywhere, and one can uh, get rid of suffering by getting rid of desire. So that's the ultimate hope of uh, Buddhism, to somewhat, in a way, annihilate oneself, and uh, that, or at least to annihilate the desire, in one and achieve a state of nirvana, which is similar to the Hindu idea of moksha, uh, but it's just called by a different uh, word. So know something about the uh, Four Noble Truths, about there being suffering, about suffering being the, co the cause by desire, and uh, the possibility of eliminating desire by, elim by, by eliminating suffering by eliminating desire, and you eliminate uh, the suffering uh, and desire by following the Eightfold Path. So in the Eightfold Path, we find almost everything that, that in that Eightfold Path are Islamic principles. Right thought, right action, right speech, right uh, living, like the, the livelihood, and so on. 
Uh, so know something about these religions so that we have a starting point for conversation. Uh, many of the people we meet uh, may have a Judeo-Christian background, so know something about the religions of the Near East. Know something about the Old Testament part of the Christian Bible, which is basically the Bible of the Jews. Know something about Judaism and its Ten Commandments, which is said to have been given to Musa a.s. Does the Quran speak about Musa a.s.? Which prophet does the Quran mention more times than any other? Musa a.s. So know something so you can speak to our Jewish friends and talk to them uh, about our Prophet Muhammad wasallam. So when we praise their prophet, they're going to awaken to this and say, yeah, that, that, that's interesting. I never thought about that before. Tell me more. You mean, really? Your Quran mentions Moses more than any other prophet? Then that's, that's tremendous. I want to know more. Know something about uh, the Christian faith. Know something about the Christian New Testament, how it is composed. What are the books that uh, comprise the New Testament? What are the key doctrines? know something about Isa a.s. beyond what is mentioned in the Quran. But of course, know what is in the Quran as well. And uh, oftentimes we Muslims have not bothered to even study what the Quran says about Isa a.s. so that we can have a starting point for dialogue with our Jewish and uh, Christian friends. The Quran actually tells us to have dialogue with these uh, people of the book in particular. People of the book, Ahl al-Kitab, they're called by this title. But what do you think? Is this a respectful title or, or a demeaning title? Respectful. A respectful title. So the Quran is referring to them uh, in a respectful way. Even though uh, they, uh, Islam is going to present a message for them, and the people who embrace this message are going to have all of the honors in the sight of Allah Azawajal. And yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to the people uh, of the scripture as people of the scripture. Meaning that they have a revelation from God and uh, they are not like uh, the people who have no knowledge about divine revelation and God's uh, will and wishes for humanity. So we then should know something about what the Quran says about them and how the Qur'an instructs us to give dialogue to them. So tell me something about how does the Qur'an instruct Muslims to have dialogue with people of the book? Tell me anything. There's no right or wrong answer. There could be many things that the Qur'an says about this. How does the Qur'an instruct us when it comes to have, having dialogue with people of the, of the book? Common what is the Qur'an? Term. Then, come to common terms. So in the third chapter of the Qur'an, the 64th ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, and call ya ahl al kitab. Say, O oh people of the book, Ta'ala ila kalimatin sawa in bainana wa bainakum, Allah na'buda illallah. Come to common terms between us and you, that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shay'an. And that we do not assign anyone as partner along with Allah. We do not ascribe it to, to, to Allah any partners. Well, uh, so happy that my son here is able to, uh, to correct uh, and, and to inform uh, me and to teach us. My, my young brother, please come forward and recite for us this beautiful ayah. Come on. I love your recitation. Uh, which rivayah uh, are you reciting according to? Watch, mashallah. How many of you can recite according to watch? It, it, not me, I shouldn't be raising my hand. I just, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, here we have uh, the new generation uh, who will know this religion better than the present uh, generation and will take this uh, religion forward and preach it uh, to the nations. We should be proud of a young man like this and cultivate other young men and women who can similarly represent this faith. Now I have to lower this for you or, or lift you up, okay? <laughs> Either way. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Well, I'm 
يشرك بي شيئا ولا يتخذ بعضنا بعضا اربابا ولا يتخذ بعضنا بعضا اربابا All right, so that was a beautiful recitation, and uh, the ayah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks better than I can speak, so I prefer to hear it from the book of Allah. So, what is this ayah telling us? To come and call them to common terms. Uh, because our purpose is invitation, we want to present Islam to them. Our purpose is not to knock down the other faiths. Uh, sometimes uh, our young uh, du'a get carried away and they think that our purpose is to prove to others that they are wrong. But if you prove to others that they are wrong, that does not mean that they will conclude that you are right. Maybe they will conclude that maybe all religions are wrong. I, brought up, I was brought up uh, on the belief that this religion is so right and now somebody's proving to me that it's wrong. Maybe the other religion is wrong too. Maybe all religions are wrong. So you do not accomplish your objective by simply proving to them that their religion is wrong or their book is corrupted or you know, there are errors and contradictions and so on. There is a place for that discussion where it becomes necessary. But you have to build interest in what you are, are saying and show them that what you have is right. So they have a candle light flickering and they light their light because it's helping them to get by in the darkness. You have to show them that you have a shining beacon. You have the sun compared with their candle. And so they have to be drawn uh, to the sun and to your beacon of light. Then when they're drawn to your beacon of light, what are they going to do with their candle? They're going to neglect their candle. It's not going to be of much use to them anymore. Uh, or they might use it in some uh, minimal way, but the main uh, light for them will now be the one you introduce them to. So be sure that your purpose is to introduce Islam to them and not just simply to knock down their uh, faith. Because trying to knock down their faith is not going to uh, do the job of bringing them to Islam. Remember that objective. Sometimes uh, we go for winning the argument and in trying to win the argument you lose the person. So keep the objective in mind. My objective is not to win the argument. Sometimes it's necessary to do that, true, uh, but uh, my objective is to win the person. So sometimes we have to acknowledge the one little truth in what the person said among the other false statements the person is making. So you can say to the person, oh, let's say he said 10 things. Only one of them is correct. You can say, you were right when you said that thing. You just pick up on the one thing that he said correct. Usually we go the other way. A person says uh, uh, 10 things, one of which is wrong, the other nine is correct, we ignore the nine, we say, you see that thing you said? That was wrong. <laughs> so then we pick up on the wrong thing, and that person is saying, what kind of person am I dealing with here? So, you know, there's somebody who's just bent on criticizing and not listening to all of the truth I've been talking about. So show them that you respect the truth that they spoke about. Find the one truth. And, and take this as uh, a lesson, not only in giving down to others, but in dealing with your family. Usually we just pick up on the one thing that somebody has said wrong or done wrong. But pick up on the one thing that they have said right or done right. Praise your children for the one thing that they have done right. I was very happy with you, my son, when you took out the trash the other day. That's so very nice. And that's it. You've given a praise and, and your praise is linked to something concrete. Not just simply you're a good boy. Okay, what did I do? Okay, okay I'm a good boy, but what, what does my dad think I'm a good boy? But tell them the specific thing that you were happy about and then hopefully next time they want to do that same specific thing and they want to try other things to get the similar compliment as well.